Welcome to a new frontiers in functional medicine where we are interviewing the best minds in functional medicine and today is no exception. I am here with a friend and colleague, a woman who I am I'm absolutely just delighted to be, to be able to connect with again. Her name is Dr. Lucia Aronica. Um, she is a lecturer at the Stanford Pre Prevention and Research Center. She's R&D lead at, on genomics at uh, Metagenics. Her research and teaching focus uh, is on how lifestyle can change gene expression through a process called epigenetics. Uh, and she is very interested in how we can use this in information to design personalized lifestyle interventions for optimal health and longevity. Uh, so she's a she's an epigeneticist. Her background is in epigenetics. We're going to talk about some of her um, her training, her postdoc work, and it's fascinating. Uh, in her Stanford course, she looks at nutrigenomics, nutrigenetics, intermittent fasting, keto diets, and the role of these interventions in personalized lifestyle and longevity medicine. She's published research papers all over the place, including in top-ranked peer-reviewed journals such as JAMA, Cell, Genes, and Development. Lucia, it is just really great to be with you again, and I am just so thrilled to be able to, you know, ping you with questions in the science of epigenetics. Thank you very much for having me, Cara. I, I hope this uh, uh, podcast will be as uh, informative uh, as inspiring for your audience. Oh, I'm sure it will be. You know, we're, you and I have already dialogued about our study. I, I, our world here um, has been... Uh, focused quite a bit on epigenetics. I mean, we have a regular clinical practice and, and, and we do, or in functional medicine, and we do lots of other things, but we put a lot of attention towards epigenetics and DNA methylation. But you're an epigeneticist. I mean, you've trained, you've spent your life in this field. I want to just define epigenetics for me. Give us like a nice, you know, few minute primer on, on, on what it is. Yes, sure. Epi means on the top. So epigenetics uh, describes um, uh, a phenomenon by which um, molecular tags on the top of our genes can turn genes on or off, just like a dimmer switch modulates lights up and down in a room. And uh, the magic of epigenetics can explain why cells or organisms um, uh, which have the same DNA can actually look very different from each other and uh, uh, have different functions uh, and, and e even health states. For example, we all have uh, in uh, every single cell of our body uh, the same uh, uh, DNA sequence, and yet our cells look different from each other. The hair cells uh, are different from the uh, eye cells or brain cells. And this is because although uh, uh, both brain cells and, uh, and, and skin cells have the same DNA, they have different epigenetic marks that turn on different genes in our brain cells and different genes in our skin cells. Uh, and, uh, and the same uh, happens for uh, different organisms, uh, for example, uh, or different states of development. Um, yeah. You can think of uh, uh, the caterpillar and butterfly. They look very different, uh, but they have, of course, the same DNA. And uh, during the development um, of, uh, of the butterfly, different genes are turned on or off. And so epigenetics... Uh, it can really explain uh, how really a genotype turns uh, into phenotype. Uh, phenotypes that can be very different depending also on environmental factors. Let me ask you, that's great. You know, just thinking about the butterfly and caterpillar, just a little tangentially, I was reading a paper not that long ago on royal jelly being something that really drives epigenetic change in bees so to, to to kind of help define who's going to be 
a queen, a queen bee. I mean, it's exactly yeah. <laughs> another very famous example. Uh, yeah. So queen bees and worker bees in a beehive actually they have the same uh, uh, genetics. Um, yeah. And uh, but uh, the queen bees are larger. They are fertile. Uh, whereas the worker bees are uh, um, uh, cannot lay eggs, and uh, and also queen bees uh, live twenty times longer than worker bees, and uh, now the only difference is an epigenetic difference, and this epigenetic difference, as you mentioned, is uh, determined during uh, um, the development or of a, a queen uh, larva into a, a queen bee because the queen, only the queen larvae are fed royal jelly, which is a protein rich substance that turns on the genes responsible for the queen phenotype. So royal jelly is the queen maker uh, <laughs> for uh, honeybees. <laughs> I'm going to ask you later, you know, do we want to be taking royal jelly ourselves oh. and, 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 and what's the queen maker for us, for humans? I mean, that's just such an extraordinary yeah, yes. story. We can, uh, we can discuss this later. Actually, We're going to yeah. talk about, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Do you have some, yeah. you have some I thoughts? Call, I call, uh, no, I just, I want to introduce the concept. I call these nutrients that are our royal jelly epi nutrients because they work through an epigenetic mechanism to turn on processes that benefit our health. So just, that is so cool. How many, so we, we know DNA methylation and we've been, you know, bandying that about here um, at, at our, our area, you know, our platform and so forth. And, and you talk about it a lot as well, but how many epigenetic marks are there? I mean, it's, you know, a friend of mine said that epigenetics is as complex as the genome is simple. You know, we were sort of like, oh my gosh, you know, when, when, the, when the genome was finally mapped out, you know, we've got less than a grape, <laughs> more than a chicken, but less than a grape. Like our, our genome is really relatively simple, um, but epigenetics is, is really the exact opposite of that. How many, it, it, comment on that and, and just really how many uh, epigenetic marks are in the mix helping phenotypic expression? Oh yes, there are many, several epigenetic mechanisms the three main epigenetic mechanisms that have been uh, best characterized so far are DNA implantation, um, histone modifications, and small RNAs. Um, and I've uh, dedicated the years of my life to study each uh, of these mechanisms. So I, my, I did my PhD at the University of Vienna where I studied the role of small uh, RNAs uh, in uh, um, gene expression. Um, and uh, then I uh, moved to the University of Oxford where I studied um, histone modifications. And finally at Stanford University where I'm looking at the link between uh, DNA uh, methylation and diet. So uh, let's go through the function of these three uh, modifications very briefly. Mm -hmm. um, so small RNAs are, uh, I think, uh, are an exciting, one of the most exciting um, epigenetic um, uh, um, regulators because they are basically mobile epigenetic modifications. They, they, um, uh, they can move from the cell nucleus to the cytoplasm and actually um, uh, uh, direct um, uh, other epigenetic uh, modifications, including histone modification and DNA methylation to uh, the right place at the right time in the cell. Um, and then histone modifications are modifications of the histones. Histones are protein that uh, help the DNA coil uh, in, inside the cell and get tightly packed so, so it can fit the cell nucleus. Uh, and this is actually why um, uh, uh, genes can be turned on or off because when the, the DNA is tightly packed in the cell, uh, the genes are turned off. So they, the cell machineries cannot 
uh, read the DNA sequence and uh, express the gene. Uh, in order to uh, turn on a gene, you need to open the chromatin, which is uh, DNA plus histones, and make those genes accessible. And you can do so either by um, uh, uh, using histone modifications, which are chemical modifications to the histones, including methylation, phosphorylation, ubiquitination, and many others, mm -hmm. or by methylating the DNA uh, with the, um, so a, a methyl group that is attached to cytosines. So cytosines are one of the four letters of uh, the DNA and can be methylated in the context of uh, CG dinucleotides uh, in our uh, DNA, which are um, um, yes sites of DNA methylation. Now, when you do so, either histone modification or DNA methylation, you can uh, um, uh, create the opportunity to open certain sites of chromatin by recruiting cell machinery is protein that open locally the chromatin and uh, and read the, the uh, underlying uh, DNA sequence. I just want to say, folks, that our DNA is almost six feet long. Like, it's uh, really yes. rather insane when you think about the fact that it is, when, she's, when, when Lucia says tightly wound, I mean, it really is packed into the nucleus of, this, of a cell. I mean, it's just yeah, mind-blowing to think about it's incredible. It's just like packing uh, a 20 kilometers, like 12.6 mile long rope into a ping pong ball. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's incredible. Right. And, Absolutely. Uh, so there's all these sophisticated, you know, activities, physiological processes happening to sort of keep it intact and then open up a little bit of a region of it. Um, to allow that area to be, be expressed. It's, it's just mind blowing. Let me ask you one more question on this topic since you're so, I just really, I appreciate this background. Of, of the three main marks, you know, the RNA, microRNA, the um, histone modifications and DNA methylation, would you say that because, so the interesting thing about DNA methylation folks is that there, there, there are enzymes that keep um, the marks intact through cell division um, and can be heritable, you know, can be transgenerational. I don't know that the same is true for histone modifications or RNA. So can you just, I mean, so of all of these, would you say that uh, even though they work in concert and there are many other marks, you know, there's many other, other uh, chemical processes occurring, but would, could, would, you, would you sort of nudge DNA to the top, DNA methylation to the top of the pile, or can you just not say that? Is it, are they too interconnected? I would say that at, as for now, DNA methylation is the uh, epigenetic modification that we have been uh, most extensively studying in the past 10 years. And the, the reason for that is that we have a way to measure DNA methylation very precisely at the single nucleotide uh, resolution and to quantify changes. Yes. After, for example, a lifestyle intervention. Um, and as you mentioned, we know how the mechanism of copying epigenetic information from a cell to a daughter cell works. Yes. And it's quite simple because when you have a methylation on a, on a C on one strand, then the, the DNA methylases uh, that are these enzymes, the writer enzymes that write DNA methylation on our DNA can come read that methylation and methylate the C on the corresponding uh, on the on the on the daughter strand DNA uh, on the complementary strand. So it's a, a, a fairly simple and established mechanism. We understand that well. We have uh, a way of measuring that very precisely. And not surprisingly, most of the studies, uh, especially uh, in epigenetics, especially linked to lifestyle factor uh, factors such as diet 
but also exposure, exposures to uh, chemicals or tobacco. These studies have been done with DNA methylation. Now, do I believe that this is the main thing? <laughs> this is the, the thing that we have been uh, uh, studying uh, uh, more and we, we have the instrument of doing that. Being a scientist, I know that this is rarely the case. Uh, usually when, when we have a new tool uh, and a new understanding of something, then we have a new lens through, you yes. know, I, I believe that um, there are indications that also the other um, uh, epigenetic marks are heritable. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 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 and actually small RNAs seems to play a role even in, in, uh, in signaling, not only inside one cells, but spreading the, um, the epigenetic signals to neighbor cells. And this is just something we are just uh, scratching the surface on that. And uh, the reason is that we don't have a precise way even of quantifying um, uh, Eastern modifications, small RNA modifications before and after. You, we can measure them, but uh, it's much more complicated, messy uh, yes. from a, from a, a laboratory uh, perspective. I've done those tests, uh, tests and uh, I must say I love epigenetics, but I, I was not the best um, uh, uh, <laughs> skilled, the most skilled uh, epigenetic chemist. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> chemist. <laughs> and it's tough. It's tough. I understand that. Yeah. I, I did just from my back, my limited chemistry training. I wasn't so good either. I was better at sort of thinking through what was happening than actually doing the experiment. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> um, I, I guess like it seems fair to assume like, you know, obviously we're writing and focusing on DNA methylation, but if we're moving the epigenome, we've got to be influencing the other players because they're just too intimately associated. So I, I, sh I should say that more, I think, in our work, but um, I, I, I think it, also kind of goes without saying that we've got to be that that, that epigenetics the epigenetic um, mechanisms are really a symphony you know they work together exactly this is a, you just made a, a good point I understand that maybe uh, especially in the functional medicine world people are more familiar with the word methylation and yes so, uh, and, and so to get the message across uh, I think it's it's fair to focus on that but as you mentioned, it's everything interconnected and the DNA methylation is very often targeted also through, for example, small RNA and things that yes. affect each other. And I think too, as we have more tools, and then I'm going to move on from this, but it's always great talking to you as, you know, because you have such a, a cool background. Um, you know, as our tools evolve and we can measure more readily, we'll be finding sort of, it will be finding like diet and lifestyle interventions that might nuance some of these other um, processes, you know, and, and then it'll come forward and sort of incorporate, I think, in our, our language and our understanding a little bit more. Um, why did you decide, you know, again, with your with your really interesting full background in epigenetics, why did you decide to focus on diet and epigenetics? Why did you decide to go in that direction? Yeah, it was uh, um, a little bit of uh, um, being able to marry together my passion for science and my um, passion for lifestyle medicine and especially food which is, uh, I think, the most powerful lifestyle uh, medicine intervention that we can, uh, can do every day. And, um, and uh, the, the field of epigenetics really um, revolutionized the way uh, I, look at, I looked at food. I um, realized that uh, food um, is not only calories, but information is one of the most powerful signals to our genes. And it's something that we can do every day. And I believe in the Pareto principle. So focus on those interventions, those factors that uh, uh, can actually uh, the, uh, enable, uh, allow you to uh, reach the 80% of the result. <laughs> this is the case of, of diet. Diet is uh, for most people, 
um, makes 80% um, of, uh, of the equation of a uh, um, healthy lifestyle. And, um, and uh, as we have discussed uh, before, we uh, have many studies point to um, the, the role of diet uh, in, uh, in epigenetics. I also had a, a personal um, story of uh, trying a new diet and, I, and having my mother, mother tried that diet and uh, experiencing um, uh, profound uh, health benefits. And so I really wanted to um, uh, study the, um, the underlying epigenetic mechanisms of this. Yeah. So the, my, my story was uh, actually, as you know, I'm uh, an Italian, so I, I've been eating uh, um, a diet uh, of uh, pasta, of the four Ps, uh, pasta, pane, which is bread in uh, English, pizza and potatoes um, uh, every day uh, until, uh, until the end of my master degrees and then the degree. And then I moved out, I moved from Italy to Vienna uh, during my doctorate and I tried um, uh, um, actually a low carbohydrate diet, I increased my fats, I just had a whole food diet with no pasta, no bread. And I experienced uh, the, uh, a revolution in my blood. Uh, my yeah. triglycerides went down three times. My HDL uh, went up three times, uh, and uh, um, and then and then I was surprised because this went against my dogma that low fat was uh, uh, good for your health and you just need to watch your calorie. Uh, and I grew up like that. I never I never had a, a weight problem, but uh, weight is not the only metrics yes. for health yes. and so anyway uh i was uh, excited by these results and then uh, i was i, I just I, by chance i read that there was a stanford study uh that um tested a uh, um, uh, uh, high fat low carb diet in women in 350 women uh, uh who experienced similar changes as i did with my, my high fat low carb diet this study was by Professor Christopher Gardner, and it was the, um, the pilot study uh, for the study I am currently working on, because then I reached out to Christopher and I wanted to, uh, to uh, uh, and I suggested I could come to Stanford and look at the epigenetic for his follow-up uh, study. So now I'm working for the Diet Fits clinical trial, which is the largest randomized uh, clinical trial uh, ever undertaken to compare a low fat, a, a low carbohydrate diet in men and women. And I'm looking at the DNA methylation before and after the diet. And this was my idea. I, I just because I, I uh, of my passion for epigenetics and uh, uh, low carb and low fat uh, nutrition. Also my mother tried uh, uh, a low carbohydrate diet. She she had a brain stroke in uh, uh, 2014, and uh, and uh, uh, the doctor, her doctor, suggested uh, her to uh, go on a low fat diet uh, to uh, lower uh, cholesterol and the uh, risk of uh, um, uh, another brain stroke. Um, but I actually suggested my mother to go on a, a low carb diet, lineage, pasta, pizza, and refined carbo carbohydrates, uh, uh, carbohydrates, focus on healthy fats. And she experienced the same uh, uh, blood lipids uh, revolution I experienced. So that when she went back to the doctor, the doctor asked her, what did you do? And, uh, <laughs> she, and, uh, and she told him, I did the opposite of what you told me to do. <laughs> I, I went on a, on a high fat diet and uh, actually she was also prescribed uh, statin drugs and she didn't take it, uh, take them. So uh, basically the opposite. And uh, so as you can see, I'm, I'm big on lifestyle and, uh, um, and I'm passionate about molecular biology and genetics. So that's my story. Awesome. Oh, it's such a great, that's just so great. I, I'm uh, certainly a lot of us have had those um, revelations of the power of nutrition. 
And the fact that you did with your epigenetic training and that you're combining forces is extraordinary. We really need you to look at that. Um, we need epigeneticists who've got this nutrition training and experience, I think, to be wetting these um, as closely as possible. I mean, can you share any of your, like, what are you seeing? I mean, any prelim results that you can, that you can share? Or are you just mid-study and you've got their baseline and you haven't actually run the analysis yet? We have done, uh, I've collected uh, the epigenetic data um, already two years ago, and um, we are still, uh, we didn't publish the results uh, results yet. I can share with you some of the patterns that we see. Yes. Uh, first of all, the most exciting uh, result, I think, is that the two diets, low fat and low carb, trigger very different epigenetic changes. So the overlap is minimal. And I think this is exciting um, uh, because really uh, it, it tells a lot about the power of, uh, of diets and nutrients, different dietary patterns to turn on uh, and off different genes. Um, yeah. uh, some of the pathways that are turned on uh, on a low-carb uh, low diet include um, immune genes, uh, for example, related to uh, natural, natural killer cells and uh, some of the pathways that are turned on on a, a low-fat diet include uh, cancer um, uh, protection genes, especially for colon cancer. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we don't know um, uh, which dietary signals uh, are responsible for these changes, whether it's the macronutrient co composition or uh, the the different uh, nutrients, different food uh, food uh, patterns on these diets or a combination of them. Um, another um, overall interesting uh, uh, result uh, that we are now uh, validating is that um, after the, the both diet, we see a reversal of uh, diabetes, uh, diabetes associated epigenetic DNA, uh, so DNA methylation, epigenetic changes. And uh, this, is, uh, um, this is huge. So uh, uh, in the past five years, um, some uh, um, epigenetic biomarkers of uh, uh, diabetes have been uh, identified, some candidate biomarkers, which means basically instead of, you may, you may know that uh, when people take uh, a 23andMe test, they receive a report saying uh, your risk for uh, a type 2 diabetes is uh, greater or lower than average. Okay, this is a, a genetic risk. And there are a bunch of genes that can, uh, can uh, uh, influence our risk uh, for developing type 2 diabetes. But the contribution of genetics to our risk uh, for uh, type 2 diabetes is less than 30%. Yeah, uh, lifestyle is uh, more than seventy percent, and some of these uh, lifestyle related risk is captured, not surprisingly, in your epigenetics and the DNA methylation. So we have identified uh, in the past um, um, five to ten years uh, some some epigenetic biomarkers of uh, of uh, type two diabetes that change depending on uh, our eating history, uh, somebody that eats, wow. uh, yes. Uh, I can't uh, wait. I can't wait until you publish. I'm just so curious. Uh, oh my gosh, I would love to see those biomarkers. Yeah, so we, um, we see yeah. some changes and we are validating um, those, uh, those data uh, with, with a bigger with a bigger analysis that trying to put together also other, other metabolomic markers. Oh, so interesting, fascinating. We are, wow. yeah. Yeah, we are going to probably collaborate with the, with the group at the U, uh, UCL University College London uh, for the metabolomic analysis. Ooh, that's, that's very exciting. Really important. I think we'll be able, it's not all or nothing. You definitely didn't say low fat is totally bad or low carb is the only diet. It sounds like we're going to get some nuancing in our yeah. understanding, yeah. which is so, it's just, I'm thrilled. I, oh man, I can't wait. You know, I want to say too, you're into longevity science as well. And a lot of the researchers in this arena are 
um, pretty aggressive with their interventions. I mean, there's, there's, there's a little bit of a drug approach, single molecules or maybe two molecules. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's talk of, of, of how we might use Yamanaka factors, which um, for folks who don't know are um, transcription factors went that there's four of them and they can, they can turn back a cell a, a, a somatic cells to its, its, its induce it to a pluripotent stem cell. So they can basically turn back the hands of time, these Yamanaka factors. And then there's the whole, you know, CRISPR technology. I mean, I mean, the longevity science scientists are, are really radical, you know, growth hormone, you know, rap, rapamycin, you know, metformin, repurposing other drugs, but it's, it's a, it's a world that I'm very interested in and excited about and, and love to see what people are up to, but people are up to some pretty, can be up to some pretty intense stuff. And I think diet and lifestyle um, is interesting to some of these scientists, but I don't know if they appreciate the power of it in the way that you are and the way that you're stating it. And I'm curious your thoughts there. Yes, no, this is a, you, you touched some very important points. So in the, in the field of longevity, there are different approaches. I, I, I represent more probably a lifestyle-based nutritional longevity approach, um, but, um, but I, I am uh, uh, actually excited to see some uh, um, other science that is targeting single mechanism uh, mechanisms of aging actually i'm uh, i'm teaching a course at stanford um, named uh, longing for longevity from biology um, uh, to biohacking and uh, my core teacher she is uh, um, dr madalena adorno she's the ceo of uh, a company uh, that is developing uh blockers so um, chemical agents that uh, block the, uh, the growth of uh, um, so-called senescent cells. These are zombie cells in our body that um, are uh, um, getting old, but at the same time, they uh, are very active in producing inflammatory molecules that trigger inflammation in our body. So uh, anyway, uh, to go back to your question, so uh, Maddalena and I represent two sides of, uh, of, uh, of the same coin, like in, uh, in longevity medicine. Um, and uh, um, I see the field of longevity me medicine uh, as uh, a field where the different interventions have uh, a, a, a synergistic uh, effect and, uh, and probably incremental effect. Uh, and also, uh, just like medicine and lifestyle medicine, also longevity needs to be personalized. So yeah. that's why I think it's important to uh, have uh, like a more general approach that includes lifestyle and which, be, uh, which will be probably the first horizon of longevity medicine, focusing on what we can do now, today. And for most people, this is lifestyle, nutrition, but also um, uh, attitude to life. It's also not only, uh, it's also like uh, meditation and uh, stress reduction. So these, yeah. just the, the, the combining these powerful uh, um, lifestyle interventions is going uh, to, um, uh, uh, to, to make us younger biologically. And we can also discuss how your, your studies, uh, your study um, uh, actually uh, demonstrated that. Uh, but I just want to add then probably the, the second and third horizon will be uh, then trying these uh, more aggressive, uh, high risk, high reward intervention that target single mechanisms uh, that may, might be relevant for a, a subset of people. And this is where personalization is important. Yes. Because uh, it, it is, uh, I, I, you know, for some, some people may have actually a higher burden of uh, senescent cells and that might be the, the biggest trigger of, uh, of uh, uh, aging in, in those people. Other people may, may have, so identifying what is the trigger, even aging is a, uh, uh, is a complex process. Now we know there are at least 10 different uh, mechanisms of aging. 
and the different people may need to focus on one, two, or three of them. Uh, and, uh, and so that's why, you know, uh, just to reply to your answer, I think lifestyle, longevity medicine is now, and is the 80% of the equation. And then probably the other interventions will uh, enable to uh, even uh, in, uh, increase lifespan, um, our lifespan in, in the next years. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I, I, that makes, that's great. That's a really good synopsis. And I think the, the, how, the, the flow of how we might um, move through these various interventions, how you're outlining, it makes sense to me. Well, let me just ask, let me ask you this question. It's just based on your last response of the, you know, the 10 mechanisms of aging. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm familiar with those. And, um, but I'm also interested in the idea that there may be some program, at least in part, driving the aging journey, um, that we're not just, you know, stochastic changes, <laughs> that it's not just oxidative stress and our toxic burden, et cetera. Yeah, of course, those are going to be driving aging, but is there an aging program? And, um, you know, that's something that we touched upon in our paper that is there an actual program and could DNA methylation play a role in that program? Because we actually see when you look at DNA methylation patterns in youth as compared to um, those who are older, they're there are almost the equal and opposite kind of patterns. It's really rather extraordinary, right? You see, you know, as we as we age, healthy or not, we're, our pro-inflammatory genes tend to get turned on our, our, and via DNA methylation or our tumor suppressor genes. Those genes that protect us from cancer are actually inhibited and shut off. And there was an interesting... Um, there was an interesting study looking at stem cells in healthy mice, and they had the, the sort of inflammation phenotype that you're describing, but they're, they're healthy. I mean, they're not diabetic mice. I mean, you would see the sort of same picture there in, in diabetic mice as well, and perhaps more so, but this idea that as we age, we may be intentionally deteriorating to sort of clear, clear space for, the, for younger folks is, is compelling, that there may be a program even as there are also, you know, these 10 mechanisms um, participating. What, what, do you, what do you think? That's kind of a big left field question, but <laughs> what yeah, are your thoughts no, there? I, I think that the, there are indications that uh, that may be the case, even, uh, um, you know, in the field of epigenetics, um, uh, there are so-called epigenetic clocks that uh, yeah. can uh, uh, measure uh, the DNA methylation at uh, different CPG sites, different epigenetic sites in your DNA, and uh, uh, measure the so-called biological age, uh, the, which is the, the epigenetic age uh, and, um, uh, of your cells, which could be like younger or older than your chronological age. Now, um, as you know, there are many epigenetic clocks. Uh, some of them uh, uh, actually um, uh, are better uh, to uh, estimate uh, chronological age, uh, like precisely, uh, like the Horvath clock 2013. And some of them seem to capture better some uh, biological age related mechanisms, um, you know, which yeah. can be senescent cells or uh, um, cancer phenotypes. And now, so to get back to your question, uh, it seems that actually the CPGs that are, are uh, um, more closely related to chronological age may capture that programming that you are talking about. I think that, that, that it, is, it looks like as we age, there is a, a sort of uh, uh, ep epigenetic aging, which is almost built in. Uh, and that signal is probably better captured by uh, clocks that estimate um, uh, are more precise uh, estimating chronological age. But on the other side, if you think about it, the, the existence of clocks that are actually closer, closely, more closely associated to biological age, 
is almost the, 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 the biological proof that there are other epigenetic signals that are not necessarily programmed like so closely associated with the chronological age. It can actually be affected by lifestyle. So yeah. I think just to, uh, to, to reply to your question, I think it's, it's a positive. Uh, there, there, is, there, is, uh, there is, yes, a program, but then uh, there are some Lego uh, pieces on the, on the top of the program that are very, very uh, much influenced by lifestyle that we can, uh, we can control. Yes. Yes. That's interesting. God, it's a good, that's a, that's a rabbit hole. We'll have to dive down into maybe some other time. It's pretty dense and, and, and challenging. Um, all right. So thank you for, you know, taking us on that really amazing tour. I want to talk to you about you know, some of the interventions in the longevity space, sort of the longevity slash epigenetic space that you're most excited about. I want to just, you know, maybe any studies you're interested in, any interventions you're interested in. And then I want to kind of finish up our conversation today with the most important, you know, lifestyle and, and, and biohacks that you're, that you yourself are using, that you're recommending and you know, just kind of speak to now what we do. <laughs> Tell us what we do. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I, I will probably starting from that. I, as I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a, a lifestyle medicine enthusiast, and I apply. I practice what I preach. I, I every day I, um, I uh, actually implement lifestyle hacks. Uh, in, uh, in my kitchen uh, and uh, in my garden when I exercise. Um, and uh, so I, I think, um, so what we can do now is uh, uh, really um, taking control of our lifestyle first with food uh, and then exercise and, uh, um, and uh, um, uh, stress control and mindfulness. And there is a, a, a common language, epigenetic language, that is spoken by all these interventions. And this language is called hormesis. Mm. Hormesis is a, a universal epigenetic language that is spoken uh, by many organisms uh, and plants even. Um, so hormesis uh, uh, means, uh, um, in, the, in the Greek language, uh, a rapid uh, uh, motion and uh, it describes the transition from good stress to bad stress uh, biologically and epigenetically so stress is actually one lifestyle hack that we can implement and use to uh, improve our health we need more good stress um, and, uh, uh, and this can be um, through food, um, exercise, and uh, um, uh, psychological hormesis. So hormesis uh, describes this process where low doses of a stressor are actually good for us. Exercise, for example, is good for us at low doses. Sunlight is good for us at low doses. Even exposure... Uh, to pathogens early in life is good for us uh, uh, because it can actually um, make us uh, more resistant to develop allergies and uh, uh, other pathologies later in life. And, uh, um, uh, and the mechanism by which this happens is an epigenetic mechanism to which uh, these low doses of stress actually turn on epigenetically genes that make our cells stronger and uh, actually younger. And uh, so it's important to use those, uh, uh, those tools, the good stress tools to um, trigger hormesis. Um, and uh, we can do that with diet, for example, the polyphenols and the epinutrients I mentioned before. Most epinutrients work through a, an hormetic process. So they turn on the genes and make us stronger and younger. And uh, the, the reason for that is, uh, as I mentioned, hormesis is, is a universal language. So even plants, when they are exposed to stress, yeah. they go to hormesis. 
and they produce these phytochemicals, epinutrients, yeah. as that in response to stress that make them more resistant to a uh, heat or uh, or a uh, um, uh, cold temperature. Uh, so, and th- when we eat those phytochemicals, we in the indirectly benefit from the hormesis of, uh, of the plants we eat. So food is a way of uh, incorporating hormesis in our life, exercise. Uh, I do, I do uh, pull-ups uh, every other day before breakfast. And in general, doing uh, some exercise 10, minu- 10 minutes before a meal, it's a great way actually to uh, 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 boost your uh, glucose metabolism and improve your uh, uh, response, glucose response to the meal. Um, and uh, even uh, um, a little sunlight and not too much, again, not too much sun, but exposure to sunlight can uh, trigger hormesis in your body uh, and psychological hormesis. So even uh, uh, life events that can be stressful for us, a divorce or uh, um, uh, losing uh, um, somebody that is important to us. These are all very sad events, but are actually from a biological standpoint, um, uh, they, uh, they create windows of opportunity for change. Our brain becomes more plastic epigenetically during those stress moments. And we, if we manage with our attitude to life to uh, to react to those events uh, uh, with the, a positive attitude and the growth mindset, we are actually stronger afterwards. I've done this many times in my life. I'm a, a very smiling person, but I had very lots of challenges and I have to thank all those adversity in life that made me what I am now, uh, a happy, yeah. smiling, healthy person. Oh, that's really beautiful, Lucia. I, I'm, uh, this is a great way for us to kind of bring our podcast to a close. I I, I love how you've described um, hormesis. It's but it's such a powerful and broad understanding. And I know it's beyond just sort of a belief that you're actually you've got science behind this as well. And it's just very very cool. How you know you've got this great Stanford class. You're engaged in cool research. How can um, how can people get access to your work? How can people follow you? Yes, so I am uh, trying to start a YouTube channel because I posted uh, some of my interviews or even the interviews we did on uh, my YouTube channel and I have received enthusiastic feedback from uh, both my Italian audience and the English audience. So probably I will be uploading more videos there and then thinking of uh, creating even a monthly Q&A in Italian and English with uh, my my followers, perhaps with a Patreon page. So uh, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm also on uh, Instagram uh, uh, and I have a website, Dr. Aronica, where you can find links to enroll in in my Stanford uh, courses. Yay! I got to attend. I listened in. I was a fly on the wall for for a portion of your course before we talked about our study and it was it was badass <laughs> it was a great <laughs> course i'm gonna I'll, I'll take it i'll absolutely take it when i can great thank you thank you you <laughs> the best student <laughs> to be continued all right dr Veronica, thank you so much for joining me on new frontiers thank you very much for having me kata